Hi, I'm Jonathan Carl, and this is lecture one on spiritual warfare in the Bible. And in this study, we're doing about 20 different videos uh, going through this book, uh, which you can download for free in a PDF on spiritualwarfare.blog. Uh, if you want a paper book version, it's pretty big and hefty, but it's on Amazon um, and about 600 pages of it. And so we'll split this up in about 20 videos. This one's the first one. And we're looking at the principal characters of God and Satan. And this is really, really important because uh, we need to know who's our friend, who's our enemy. Uh, if you were in the military, one of the things you would do is you would study uh, maybe vehicles. How do you recognize what's a friendly vehicle? How do you recognize what's an enemy vehicle? And not only what the vehicles look like, you would, you would study maybe the uniforms of the soldiers and the abilities, the capabilities, uh, the strategies, the tactics, both of your friends and of your foes. And in a similar way, God instructs us and shows us who he is by his names, uh, his works or his miracles, uh, his character. And, and then he warns us of our enemy, our enemy's names, uh, works, uh, capabilities, and strategies. And so we're going to learn a lot today uh, just on uh, God and on uh, Satan, uh, a fallen angel against God. So this is just a brief overview. Of course, there's a tons more here in this book, uh, but let's get started. First of all, according to God is what we want to know. What does God say about it? What does the Bible say about it? Not simply, what are people's experiences? And then tied into that, we're actually going to talk about Christmas and Easter, which might seem like just a holiday, but really that's celebrating two of the most important miracle works of God in Jesus's birth and Jesus's crucifixion and resurrection and the prophecies that go with it to show us how God reveals himself and that he is true. So those are very important to understanding who God is and how he works against the enemy. Some of the names of God, uh, the Father, uh, I love this Psalm 8-1, O oh Lord, O oh Lord, how majestic is your name in all of the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Now, I can't read all of this or all of the scriptures, but uh, this is how we start. It's almost a, a worshipful, it is a worshipful start. And that as you read these names, whether you download it yourself on spiritualwarfare.blog or you've got the book, just listen to some of the names of God the Father, Elohim, our creator, uh, Abba, Father, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, El Shaddai, the Almighty, uh, Ancient of Days, Deliverer, Everlasting God, Fortress, God Most High, God of Knowledge, the Great I Am, the God who sees, the God who gave you birth, uh, the Just One, the Lord of All, the Lord our Banner, the Lord our Creator, Lord our Healer, uh, Lord our Peace, our Provider, our Righteousness, our Shepherd. The Lord is there and as majestic as his name. You know, he, he is the self-existent one. He is Yeho Jehovah, Yahweh. Now, I didn't read all the scriptures that go with that. And even in the book here, there's just a few examples of the scriptures. But God loves us enough to tell us who he is by his name. Uh, Jesus, all the names of Jesus. So we don't have just God the Father's names. We have God the Son. And we know he's called Jesus. That's what uh, Mary and, uh, is told uh, with her husband Joseph. But um, we know so many of the names of Jesus. Again, there's so many of them here. Advocate, anointed one, author of life, beloved son, bread of life, bridegroom, bright morning star, chief shepherd, cornerstone, door, faithful witness, the founder and perfecter of our faith, the captain of our salvation. He is God. He is the good shepherd, the great high priest, the head of the church, the image of the, of the invisible God. He is Emmanuel, God with us. He is our judge, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the Lamb of God, the light of the world. Now, I'm only halfway through the list. And when we think about this, this is our God who is with us. We should be overwhelmed by the names of Jesus. And uh, you can read for the rest of them for yourself, but here's some of the names of God the Spirit. God the Spirit. Here's some of his names for us because we know God is spirit. We need to worship him in spirit and truth, but he is the breath of the Almighty, 
our helper, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of adoption, the spirit of judgment and burning, the spirit of Christ, spirit of glory, spirit of God, spirit of grace. And again, that's just half of the names. And so maybe consider taking these names of God and use it as a devotional time just to worship him. Uh, there's other helpful places you can find, maybe a book like God Is by Kenneth Hephel. One of my favorite websites is gotquestions.org, where you can find a whole lot more information on the names of God. Adrian Rogers has a free downloadable resource on the names of God. And Rose Publishing makes some really neat posters and booklets that go through the names of God. But the more you are amazed by our God, the more courage you'll have in the battles you face. And another great thing, important thing to look at is the miracles of God. And you probably know some of them, but I want to encourage you in this study, you can download it or find it directly on the website, spiritualwarfare.blog. But the miracles and works of God, I took some of the most important ones, I think. Um, and I think I've got a hundred and let me see, we've got about 160 of them across the Old Testament and the New Testament. And we need to remember, our God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Yeah, 176 miracles here. And you could just do a huge Bible study seeing the works of God. And the more you see his power and his goodness through his miracles, the less fear you will have as your enemies come against you. Not only do we see the miracles of God, but we see the character of God. And we've seen some of that just in his names of who he is, but we see what God is like. Romans 1.20, God says his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power, his divine nature, has been clearly seen and perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they're without excuse. God reveals himself through the creation. He reveals himself directly through his names that he gives us in the Bible, and he gives us a lot of glimpse into who he is by his miracles. But here's some of the characteristics of God. He is a unity. He is beautiful. He is blessed. He's a creator. He's divine. He's eternal and he's pre-existent. He is faithful. He is freedom. He is good. He's gracious and he's merciful. He is holy. He is independent. He doesn't need anyone or anything. He's innocent. He's invisible, he's jealous, he's just, he's knowable, he is love. He's omnipotent, means all-powerful. He's omniscient, means he's all-knowing. He's omnipresent, which means he is everywhere at once. He's perfect, he's righteous, he's sovereign, he's in control. He is spirit, he is strength, he is truthful, he is unchangeable, he wills, he is wise, he's worthy, and he's wrathful towards sin. Our God's an amazing God, and as you read the scripture and read these descriptions, you'll be more amazed at his goodness. Now, unfortunately, one of the modern day problems we face in false teachers, and we'll talk more about false teachers as we continue in this study, is people present a false version of Jesus. Maybe you're familiar with the term identity theft. Identity theft happens when one person pretends to be another, uh, presents a false version of you to someone else for some sort of benefit. And here's 10 ways you probably heard and seen some of these in books or teachers, even popular teachers and popular books that misrepresent the Jesus of the Bible. They present a partial view of Jesus and they prevent, present ultimately a corrupted view of Jesus. So here's 10 of those ways. They create basically a God in their own image, which is basically an idol. And there's a warning of this, of the false prophets. Second Peter 2 tells us false prophets arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies even denying the master. So when a false version of Jesus is being presented, they are denying the true version of Jesus, who is our master. So here's 10 of them. One, uh, a, a personal motivator of Jesus. You're only going to hear positive things. You're not going to hear a talk about sin. It's all about positive thinking. It's about unity, avoiding uh, hard teachings. It's all about unity over holiness. It's an intolerant tolerance. So there's no woe to you uh, versions of Jesus. It's, it's all about uh, a, a molding and shaping of morality. That sounds a whole lot like the world around. There's a smooth talking version of Jesus. 
He's attractional. He's popular. He's presented really as worldly. Um, there's no offense in him. Uh, it's just absolute truth statements are put to the side. Only the things that ultimately tickle the ears. They'll present Jesus sometimes as just a good teacher, a wise man, a good example. And they'll ignore or they'll put doubt on Jesus's divinity. Uh, they'll also, you'll see some that will make a focus on Jesus's healer. And it ultimately becomes a message about the miracles rather than God himself. Sometimes people will present Jesus as a giver of abundant life. It's all focused on here and now, being blessed here and now, treasures on earth. And you don't hear a focus on seeking the things above. You'll also see a version of Jesus that's a universal salvation. That everybody basically sounds like they're going to heaven. There is no hell. They may not say it that way, but in the content of what's communicated, that's the focus of their version of Jesus. Seventh, sometimes you'll focus on a, uh, you'll hear a, a version of Jesus that just focused on make yourself better, be your best self, that it's all about you changing yourself, and it's less about the Holy Spirit's work through repentance and sanctification. Eighth, you'll see one, a version of Jesus that's all about you loving yourself and being satisfied rather than the concept of let him deny himself when we follow Jesus. You hear another version of Jesus that's all about you obeying your feelings, you submitting to your experiences and your emotions and your opinions rather than what God says. Finally, you'll find a false version of Christianity that makes Jesus a servant of you, almost like a genie in the bottle, uh, where whatever you want, if you just have enough faith, he'll grant it. But that's not the version of Jesus in the Bible. It's not the true Jesus. So as a fair warning, Satan is a deceiver. He's a father of lies. And one of the ways he wants to work against uh, God's work is by convincing us there's a different version of Jesus. He steals Jesus's identity. Now, Christmas is important because uh, it's, it's, it teaches us that God had to become human. And so uh, that we see uh, Jesus's birth um, and you might be very familiar with these stories. You may not, but within this book, you'll find probably some of the most common questions you face about Christmas, but some of the most important scriptures you need to know about Christmas, that we ultimately are all called to look for Jesus, look to Jesus, find joy in Jesus, that he's the ultimate gift given to us to enjoy and to share. I love Isaiah seven fourteen. It's one of the many prophecies of Christmas Isaiah 7, 14 tells us, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a son. Behold, the virgin will, shall conceive and bear a son, and you shall call his name Emmanuel. We need to know about Jesus' birth, but we also need to know about his death, burial, and resurrection. It's a miracle. It's an amazing miracle. Uh, it's part of his work and his character that he lays down his life for us. And Easter is all about this. Uh, now, we have, again, a lot of good questions people have about should we celebrate Easter? What about the is it a pagan origins? But ultimately, what our focus needs to be on Jesus becoming human and laying down his life on the cross. So uh, a lot of prophecies um, I put in there, kind of a helpful day-by-day -day approach if you're interested in that. Also, Jesus's final words from the cross. And at the end of the day, Easter is showing us that Jesus is, it's his work. It's his finished work on the cross by which we may be forgiven, by which our sins can be cleansed from us. It's not by our works. It's by, not by our goodness but it's by his. So we need to realize with Christmas and Easter, it's not just about traditions and holiday stories. It's ultimately about the birth, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus. And again, Satan's gonna try to distract us from that, corrupt that, but it's essential to understanding who God is and what he's accomplished on our behalf. Now, our enemy, we need to study our enemy. We need to know his names. Uh, a lot of them out there, here's some of them. The accuser, your adversary, the angel of the abyss, the pit, antichrist, Beelzebul, uh, the prince or ruler of demons, the lord of flies, the Belial, Daystar, the deceiver, uh, Lucifer, the devil, the dragon, the enemy, the evil one, father of lies, king of Tyre, a murderer from the beginning, prince of powers of the air, a roaring lion, the ruler or god of this world and age, Satan, the serpent, slanderer, the tempter, the thief, the wolf. 
Now, you might know most of these, and you might know where those verses come from and those references come from, but we need to be able to identify our enemy. We need to understand how he works against God's work. And here's some of his works that we need to understand. 2 Corinthians 2.11 encourages us to be aware, to be understanding his strategies and his tactics, ultimately his works, so that we are not outwitted. Here's some of them. We don't want to be ignorant of his designs. He arrogantly resists God. He vainly relies on himself. He appeals to fleshly desires, ambition, covetousness, and pride. He incites pride in numbers. He travels continuously across the earth. He steals away earthly possessions, positions, and people. He attacks us physically, mentally, and emotionally. He enters into God's presence sometimes to uh, gain permission to attack the believers of God. He actively tempts us away from following God. He puts false believers among true believers. He distracts believers' minds towards earthly things. He persistently tempts people by twisting scripture. We see that in his temptation of Jesus. He prevents the gospel from being understood and believed. He offers shortcuts away from God's provision. He baits you towards seeking possessions, power, and prestige. He tries to get you to manipulate God. He's patient as he looks for future temptation opportunities. He prevents the Bible from being heard, understood, loved, and believed. He at times enters into people, we call that possession, into humans for his own purposes. He spreads hatred, he spreads lies, he kills and he destroys. He provokes betrayal against God. He dangerously attacks the followers of Jesus and he provides pathways for greed. There's so much more about how Satan works. I hope you'll read the rest of it, but we need to be aware and not ignorant of his, his designs. And that all comes out of his character. He disguises himself as an angel of light Think about it. Why does he do what he does? What are his abilities? What are his motives? What are his goals? Well, God tells us a lot about it, but the ultimate root of all of these works is a character of pride. And so he's, if you think about a, a maybe a hundred dollar bill, the most counterfeited bill uh, currency in all of the world, people want to make it look like it's the real thing. So they counterfeit it. They present the direct opposite of that but they want to make it look like it's true. And that's what Satan does. He wants to present himself as the true God. So he counterfeits and imitates God, but twists and manipulates things as well. So you might look at some of the characteristics of God and you'll see the opposite occurs in Satan. Here's some of them. He's limited in his beauty versus God's absolute beauty. He's a singular being versus God's Trinitarian unity. He's cursed, God's blessed. He's created, God is the creator. He's a source of death, God's the source of life. He is everlasting destruction versus God is, provides everlasting life. And on and on, we can see the characteristics of Satan, and it's important because he's trying to come against us. But in all of this, Satan might try to take your attention off of God and onto him, but we need to keep our eyes on God. Here's five important truths about our God as a warrior. I love this from Psalm 20, that uh, we might have a temptation, people have a temptation to trust in human means, human warfare, chariots, horses, but what do we do? We trust in the name of the Lord our God. And the more you know his names, the greater you will find yourself able to trust him in the midst of difficulty. Another great verse, I love this. It's about David, and maybe you know the story of him striking down uh, Goliath, but his confidence was in his God. He said, the Lord delivered me from the paw of the lion. The Lord delivered me from the paw of the bear. The Lord will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. So as you look backwards, at the miracles of God across the scripture, as you look maybe even at the miracles that God has done in your own life, may you have that confidence in the Lord's power in every battle you face. I love the story of Hezekiah. The city is surrounded by the enemy and overnight the Lord sends an angel out and destroys 185,000 Assyrians. That's the greatest one day loss of troops I've ever seen in world history, military history. And it's because of the hand of our warrior God. 
Another great verse from Jeremiah 20, 11. Again, many times Jeremiah is alone, finds himself alone in battle, so to speak, as he seeks to be faithful to God. But he said, the Lord is with me as a dread warrior. Therefore, my persecutors will stumble. They will not overcome me. They will be greatly shamed. They will not succeed. Their eternal dishonor will never be forgotten. And that's really tied to the fact that God is with you. His name's Emmanuel. And if you are in Christ, God is with you always. And all the way to the end, when he delivers the kingdom to God, the Father, after destroying every rule, every authority, every power, he reigns until every enemy is under his feet and the last enemy to be destroyed is death. So see the power of your God and that he's with you. I love, you probably already know this, Joshua 1, 9. If you don't know this, it's we find our strength, we find our courage in who God is and that he is with us if we are in Christ. And if you're not yet in Christ, I just wanna encourage you, don't wait another day. Your enemy is real. Satan is real and he is deceptive. And yes, he has a lot of powers and abilities, but our God is greater. So if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that Christ died on the cross and rose from the grave, God will be with you as he is with Joshua all the days of your life. So you can be strong and courageous no matter the battles you face. Well, this is lecture number one. We've got about 20 other ones out there coming up. So I hope you'll stay tuned, tune in, find, watch more, learn God's word, share it maybe online with friends and family. God bless you.